So today, uh, obviously, we are, we are honored uh, to have uh, one of our distinguished scientists, T.K. Uh, Bhatia, who agreed to come in for a second time uh, because we noticed that we missed the early talk, we never left Corinthians. And uh, because this is very important, we want to keep a record of uh, what our, our giants did uh, in the past. So and he agreed kindly uh, to come back and have the talk recorded. And I'm sure he has added a lot of other things. But I wanted to remind the audience one very important thing. Uh, this month, 30 years ago, in 1985, uh, P.K. Barrier stood in front of the world. And for the first time, the world was able to see large uh, extended ozone hole, what was literally called as the ozone hole. And obviously he never anticipated the kind of attention he was going to get, but to a great extent he reformed and uh, dictated out of his, uh, what he did in his career. So today he has got a very exciting talk. I'm sure uh, some of the stuff that happened around the ozone hole, uh, which in fact uh, some, some people have said is probably one of the most important environmental discoveries of the 20th century. So uh, perhaps somebody who was in the front line of that struggle, I think is a, a big honor. So today he's going to talk about the Maxwell demo, black swan born <coughs> into uh, scientific hindra. So please, with that short introduction, help me welcome P.K. Bhatia. <laughs> Charles didn't mention that he also told me that John Mather has given two talks in this, in this. well, you know, that's a great honor, but I'm no John Mather, <laughs> and, John, and John can give five talks and still not exhaust everything, and I have very limited material. So what I did was that I'm not going to talk everything that I said last time two and a half years ago, uh, what I'm, uh, but I will have some of that in there, but I also added some personal touches here which I did not cover last time. That is very hard for me to do. And those of you who know me, I really don't like to talk about myself. But I decided to add a few things in there, so hopefully uh, you'll enjoy it. And uh, I'm, I'm keeping it somewhat lighthearted than the previous one. Um, this image is my favorite ozone hole image because it is split into two. This was a 2002 image. And a lot of people were wondering about, in fact, I was in Bermuda perhaps at that time and that whether this is going to split and move north and maybe destroy all of us. <laughs> so, you know, the ozone hole, as you know, and it still is, it, after so many years of the discovery, after the discovery, it is still is a very, very, very interesting subject for a lot of people. And, um, and, and it still keeps a lot of people very interested. It has now become, a, you know, in the movies and literature and everywhere it shows up. Um, so, uh, what the, the title actually talks about are three phases of my career, a student phase, early phase, and now the more recent phase. And so I picked these titles from some of the talks I've given before. Uh, so, so the first one uh, came from a talk I gave as, as a graduate student at Purdue. And when I joined the uh, scientific group over there, uh, it's called ENDOR spectroscopy. ENDOR stands for electron nuclear double resonance. And um, I felt something very similar to what uh, was felt by George Paik, who uh, was a graduate student at the time at Harvard. And, and he was working on magnetic resonance with Professor Edward Purcell, who got a Nobel Prize in the discovery of nuclear magnetic resonance in solids. And so he said something about uh, in, in one of the places I was reading an article that a Maxwell demon clambering about in a crystal lattice. This is how he felt. And by the way, he later on became a very famous scientist himself. He was the head of the Xerox uh, Palo Alto lab uh, for many years. And so what I was telling uh, the faculty when I gave this talk in 1972, that I sort of felt the same way uh, as uh, George Peck felt about this particular field, which is electronuclear double resonance. And I talk about it and then finally said what it is supposed to do, although I don't think I really understand what this means anymore. Perhaps I did at that time. Um, but um, uh, so, that, so this is something, so what I'm really trying to convey to you is the excitement uh, as a graduate student one feels ab about getting into a subject, uh, which of course has become pretty mundane. I think a lot of people now in physics, they're doing ama amazing things, uh, all kinds of things that you read about and, uh, in, uh, in physics today and elsewhere. Um, 
but what happened was, as time went on, I realized that the field I was getting into, uh, or have, had gotten into, was, had already matured. And there were uh, fewer and fewer papers coming out, and most people were leaving and going to uh, laser spectroscopy, because lasers were a big thing right at that time, and many, many people were moving into that area. People were doing solid state physics, for example. So what I did was I became very much interested in computer science. Uh, Purdue had a very nice computer science department. They had one of the largest supercomputers of the time, CDC 6500. And I got very interested in that, started taking courses, undergraduate, then graduate courses. And finally, uh, by the time I finished my PhD in 1977, uh, I had also obtained at the same time a master's degree in computer science. And at that time, it was difficult to find jobs in physics, and particularly in the field I was in. Uh, so I really seriously thought about moving and becoming a computer scientist. I interviewed Bell Labs, CDC, Willard Packard, and two places I got the job, Bell Labs also. But uh, because of some visa issues, they did not work out, and finally I ended up here with a contractor at Goddard in 1977. So there are two things I'm going to mention about my um, graduate student career. One was that when I was working there, one, one of the things we did was that we had these large magnets, and you have to find um, the magnetic field very accurately, to measure the magnetic field very accurately. And, and what we had was a proton sample, and you do a nuclear magnetic resonance of that. And I remember that it was so tough to do it because these magnets are not very high quality. You have to position them very accurately in order to get uh, a good signal. Well, some, uh, or not just one person, but several smart people in a few years had figured out how to take advantage of that, you know, that high sensitivity they had. And now, as you know very well, there's magnetic resonance imaging born out of that. Because somebody figured out that they can actually create a magnetic field that varies as a highly in inhomogeneous, and then you can use magnetic resonance. And now, of course, this is a huge field. And of course, that only happened five years after I, uh, after this, after I gave this talk. And you really do not know how these very esoteric things that you do in a lab can end up being a diagnostic tool in medicine. So this was one of the uh, great revelations. I immediately understood. What, once I heard about it, it was very clear to me how it was done. Of course, I did not figure it out myself. Um, the, the second thing I remember was that because I was doing computers, uh, I started working with Hamiltonians and start diagonalizing them, fitting that to the spectrum I, t I took. And what was amazing to me at the time, by the time I finished, is that how you can take something as esoteric, a mathematical concept like Hamiltonian, and fit something that was created on using a, actually it was a World War II era hardware, klystrons, magnetrons, and big X-band uh, um, uh, hardware. And you can get spectra from it, and you can use your, uh, uh, this very esoteric mathematical concept and actually fit that. And you, you know, I think it's a very emotional experience, actually, to be able to be able to take a mathematical concept like that and be able to explain all of these things that are coming out of a, of a measurement. And that has stayed with me. I think I call, I call that as, a, as an experience that you never, ever forget. So those are the two things I'm going to mention about my earlier career. And then I'm going to go to the uh, second phase. OK, so I came here. And um, this was a group that I ended up as a, uh, as a contractor. And uh, this field was started by uh, Donald Heath, who had come in here from Johns Hopkins. And he started a measurement program in ozone. And then later on, Arlen Kruger, who is here, uh, joined uh, him. And this turned out to be a major program for NASA. And it still continues to be a major program. The NASA is spending a lot of money in trying to measure ozone, still after so many years. And, and as I said in, in the talk I gave some years ago, got a colloquium that what they started was essentially a curiosity driven, res driven research. They were not really looking for changing the world. They were not trying to measure things that, uh, that ultimately would lead to a phase out of chemicals. But it turned out to be that way. And this is how research works. You do not start out by doing things uh, with a certain goal in mind. You do something that is pure research, and it ultimately leads to something very interesting. So, so what they started, in, um, so the first instrument that was flown was in Nimbus 4 BUV in 1970, April 1970. Um, then there was another instrument, which I don't show here because NASA has lost the data set. Uh, it was uh, flown on atmospheric explorer satellite, called, also called BUV. And after that, um, sorry. Uh, the major program this started here was number 7 SBUV. Uh, in fact, this instrument was in pioneering many, many respects. Uh, the MODIS, for example, has adopted some of the ideas. Uh, for example, looking at the sun using a diffuser plate. 
Uh, that was the first time, I believe, it was ever done, at least for in our sciences, maybe the space science people may have done it before, and to try to measure both the sun and the, and the earth, and they take the ratio to cancel out some of the instrumental effects, and also you can look at the sun. Uh, but this did not work very well, the number 7 SPV was the same way, and then after that, all of these instruments, the NOAA flew based on the same design that originally came out of, uh, of number 7 SPV. Unfortunately, NOAA satellites have been a drifting satellites, uh, although they are nominally sun synchronous, they drift a lot, and that causes a problem for the instrument like a, that measures the ultraviolet light because uh, drifting instruments are not very good for those kind of measurements. Uh, but the most more recent NOAA instruments have done very well, and now the, um, the most recent one that was launched was in, in 2011, um, October 2011, uh, 36 years after the launch of the Nimbus 7 SPUV, and not a whole lot has changed between Nimbus 7 SPUV and, and the arms. You know, after all of these, I said, the only thing that has changed is the detector. Uh, then we no longer use photomultiplier tubes. What we're using now are CCDs. And uh, let me tell you a story. Last week, I was in Montreal uh, to give a talk, and somebody from Argentina came to me, and he said that he was very disappointed that over Argentina, we don't provide any data because of South Antarctic anomaly. Well, that reminded me that Don Heath and, uh, worried a lot about that, and this instrument was very carefully designed to cancel out any South Atlantic anomaly effects. But now, when we went back to the CCDs, uh, that has come back again. And a lot of our data sets are thrown away uh, over that area because of the charged particle anomaly over South Atlantic. So, um, <coughs> so it was a really a pioneering instrument, and it has really continued, and, and I think it's going to continue for quite some time now. The other program that was started was by uh, Armin Kruger, and there was a number seven, uh, the first phone flown on the TAMS instrument, the total ozone mapping spectrometer, in, uh, again in 1978, along with the SPUV, and then there was a Russian uh, meteor TAMS, Earth probe TAMS, and then this was an OMI instrument that was provided to us by the Dutch, and we had had a long uh, record now, now we've just finished 10 years of OMI uh, measurements, and finally the, the NPP satellite, which I mentioned uh, earlier was launched on October 28th, 2011. So, so we have been working on both of these, and they have been a long-term NASA program with quite well-funded. Uh, this shows you the launch of the TAMS, Meteor 3 TAMS. This was launched in August 15, 1991, right at the time when um, the Soviet Union collapsed. In fact, those of the, I was not part of that, but Arlen Kruger and others who went there I think they had a very interesting story to tell, and I'm assuming that Arlene is going to give a talk on this at some point uh, in, in the series. Um, so, what, as I said before, that this has been a long-term program, and one of the things that NASA continues to do is to give us money to go back to the record and keep uh, uh, reprocessing the data and, and look at, looking at this record over again and again and again. And so this is the most recent uh, reprocessing that we have done. Uh, in fact, this paper this is just coming out by Stacy uh, Frith at JGR 2014. And what it is showing you is our best information we have uh, regarding uh, the total ozone record. Um, if I look at this, uh, this slide here, basically showing you that um, what the, uh, the total ozone has changed in this uh, uh, latitude range, 60 south to 60 north, this is area weighted uh, over this entire record we have, um, ex except for this gap here. And this is for the tropics. When I was talking to a friend recently, I told him that uh, the nature certainly has a sense of humor. This is not what, what anybody would have expected in 1990 that things are going to look like. What we would have expected it to look like would be what people now call hockey stick. The word hockey stick was used a lot at that time. Basically, what you were expecting was that there would be a decrease, and, and then basically there will be recovery at the end of this period when the CFCs start to get uh, lower, uh, the chlorine amounts start to deplete. What you actually see here is more like a reverse Hopkins stick. You see a big, fairly significant decrease and essentially no change uh, in the last, say, 20, 30 years. Well, why that has happened? Well, the reason is that there are many other things going on at the same time, and it's not the same, almost exactly the same for climate, that it's not just one thing that is causing it. There is a solar cycle, there's a volcanic effect uh, of the Pinatubo that you see here in 1991. And you have to unscramble this, this time series to find out is what is the effect of chlorine and what is not and what are other effects there. If you look at the tropics, for example, uh, most of what you see is an 11-year cycle. And you're really not seeing almost any effect of the chlorine. So um, Stacy was able to separate them out. And this is what you get when you actually fit it to multiple things like solar cycle and, and volcano and others, QBO. 
And, and what you get is, uh, is what is called, um, to fit to EECSC, EECSC stands for equivalent, effect, equivalent effective stratospheric chlorine. In other words, how much chlorine there has been in the stratosphere, and there are other gases as well which act like chlorine. And you take that and you fit it, and what you find here is that in the tropics there has been virtually no change over, the, uh, over this last uh, several decades. Uh, but as you go into the mid-latitudes, you start to see a change which is roughly equal to what was predicted many, many years ago, but not in the tropics. Uh, most models are still predict, for example, in the tropics, there is an ozone decrease should be happening, and they can't explain why uh, the measurements are not showing any decrease. Uh, but of course, the big news there is what is going on in the polar regions, uh, both polar regions, although this one is much, much bigger. So that brings me to the next talk here, that I had a discussion with a modeler here in 19... Uh, in 1983. And the discussion was along these lines that uh, he was talking to me and said that, well, uh, at that time I was a manager of this program, and he said that the models are predicting 1% per decade change in global total ozone. And he was asking me, can I measure that from number seven times? And I said, most likely not, because the instrument was degrading pretty rapidly, and I was not very optimistic that you can make measurements of that accuracy. So he's basically said that, uh, so he basically said the measurements are not useful then. And I said then, uh, perhaps in anger, that the measurements are needed solely to validate models, or should we actually be doing it because the measurements are important in themselves? Um, well, it turns out that this is a very important issue that all of you who are working on climate uh, are facing the same problem, is that we have a global change dilemma that the models like to predict changes on global averages. So you get big area averages, and they're very comfortable predicting that. The problem is that those changes tend to be very small and they're very, very hard to measure with the accuracy that you really need. What we're very good at doing, from with satellites in particular, are making predictions reasonable scale, which are much, much larger, but unfortunately, they're much harder to predict. So people would like to know very much whether the doubt in California is caused by global warming or not, but no modeler is comfortable making a prediction of that kind. And that really is a problem. We face the same exact problem here uh, at that time. That was in 1983. Uh, what neither of us knew at the time that things were happening over Antarctica that, none of, that neither of us knew. And so that brings me to the second part of my talk, which is this book that I read a couple of years ago. Um, this book is uh, it's a very interesting book to read, although the person who wrote that is somewhat arrogant, and he, has been, uh, he basically has been trashing almost everybody, including the, some of the very senior Nobel laureates in, in, in economics and finance. So, but what his main point is is still correct, I think, that he's, he calls that a black swan event is an event. By the way, this is a real black swan, just later found out in, in Australia. It's very rare, but it actually it does exist. Uh, most, uh, there are few cases like that. So a black swan event is an event that had no prior warning. It has a major inf effect, um, you know, like the 2007 economic collapse. Uh, is inappropriately rationalized with the benefit of hindsight. Although I particularly don't like this th third bullet, what I would have said instead would be uh, that there are multiple theories to explain it, and, uh, and not that it's inappropriately rationalized. So if you look at that, the Antarctic ozone hole fits uh, this very, very well. It was a total surprise. There were no predictions, as I know of, of by anybody that, that you would have that kind of a change in the Antarctica. Uh, it changed the course of the multi-billion industry, so it did have a major effect. And the explanations were very different uh, at the time. Some of them were uh, suggesting it was meteorology. There was even one paper that talked about cosmic rays. And, uh, and very few people actually talked about this being due to anthropogenic chlorine, which later on turned out to be the right explanation for it. So it does fit in very nicely. If you have time, if you find this book, it's very interesting to read, as I said. Uh, there are things about the book I don't like, but it does make some very interesting points. He basically says that uh, the world doesn't behave like a Gaussian curve or a bell-shaped curve. He said people like to think that all the errors that you have, all the variability you have, you talk about two sigma, three sigma, and four sigma, he said that's not how the world behaves. You get uh, m m far more frequently changes that occur at five, 10, 20 sigma levels. And you really have to prepare yourself for it because um, you, know, you, you, you don't want to lock yourself into this thinking of everything is, behaves like a Gaussian curve. Um, okay, so how, so, so the first paper that came out, this paper came out in 1985, uh, written by uh, British scientists who are working in a very obscure place. In fact, 
I did not personally know that they were actually making measurements because they never sent their data to uh, Toronto where uh, the data were archived. Uh, we were working with a lot of other people, but these people were toiling in this very, very difficult place. It is not McMurdo. Uh, Halle Bay is a very tough place to work on. It, and this, the facilities were not very good, but they kept on working on it. And then in 1985, they published this paper where basically said that um, they were seeing large losses of ozone. And the important point they made here was that this was caused by Chlorine, uh, well, although they say chlorine and NOx interaction, which is probably not the correct explanation. Oh, well, uh, in any case, uh, they did suggest it was caused by chlorine. Um, and basically, this was the, the plot they made. And they were trying to show here that the, uh, the change in the chlorine and the change in ozone was sort of match here by showing uh, the dotted, dotted lines. And they even said that in other months also, like February, there was some relationship, although I don't think this is very persuasive at all. In fact, there was no chlorine-related change in February that we know of. Um, so, so, but this was a very important paper. And this was measured in Halle Bay at 76 degrees south. So this, of course, was big news in 1985. It came out in Nature. And then a few months later, uh, I gave this presentation in a meeting in Prague, Czechoslovakia. So to my best of my knowledge, this is the first picture of ozone hole made. And this was, I presented that in uh, Park Czechoslovakia, I'm sorry, um, in August 1985. So there was just a few months after the Nature paper came out, and neither of us knew about each other's uh, results. Um, uh, Joe Farman has said that he had tried to contact NASA, but somehow that contact never was sent to us. And we did not know he was taking measurements because they never sent the data to the archives. So we were basically totally uh, independently uh, coming to this conclusion. That happens a lot in science, as you guys always know. That if, if the two of us had not found it, somebody else would have found it in a few months. Because there's so many people making measurements of Antarctica, and there are balloon measurements, there are all kinds of things happening. So this result would not have been delayed very much. But, it, it, but this is the way it happened that uh, in a few months later that I presented this. And right after that, there was a meeting in Salzburg, Austria, uh, which was arranged some time ago. But this is Don Heath in front. Um, and um, you know, his girlfriend, who organized it in Salzburg, uh, now they're married. Uh, this is Sherry Rowland, who um, uh, won the Nobel Prize for it. He recently passed away. Uh, you have Bob Watson here. And I'm standing right here. But there are several other people, very prominent. Uh, I think Arlen is not here. He was working, doing something else at the time, looking at the Mars instrument. Um, <laughs> OK, so, uh, so what happened in this meeting? Well, most people were not quite sure what to think of the Nature paper. You know, they were looking at the image that I had just shown, and they thought there was something real happening there. But they were not exactly sure what was going on. There were different theories. And there was one theory from uh, this gentleman over here who said that it was cosmic ray. Um, then there were other theories as well. But I think that Sherry Rowland had the inkling that something actually was due to chlorine. And what he did was took the picture I, I, I presented just uh, at the, in the meeting, and he gave it to New York Times. And the New York Times published it that I think a month or two later, in the, it came out in the New York Times, that picture that I just showed. So I think he probably knew very much more than anybody else did that this really was being caused by chlorine. And of course, it turned out to be right. And of course, this is, became a big news, uh, it, as, as uh, Charles pointed out, this is an uh, icon of environmental degradation. It showed up in all kinds of news, news magazines. Um, uh, I don't know, wherever you go, you see these things. So what happened next? Well, I think this is something that NASA should be very proud of. Uh, NASA sponsored an international field campaign in Antarctica, what many of the people here were involved in, uh, with very high quality laboratory grade instruments that were flown. Uh, some of them with Harvard and other places. And they really were able to uh, sort out this, this problem very quickly. And it was quickly determined that the ozone depletion was indeed caused by active chlor chlorine, as uh, was being discussed. And that chlorine was being released by ice clouds called PSCs, uh, polar stratospheric cloud. And those clouds were actually measured by a NASA instrument. We have a pretty good record of that from the SAM-2 instrument uh, of the PSCs. Uh, and, but also dynamics also play a very major role. It is not just an isolated chemistry effect, but because you need to have an isolation of air. So the ozone depletion occurs only in the air trapped within the polar vortex. And as soon as the polar vortex breaks down, uh, the effect essentially goes away, although there are some secondary effects still there. But most of the effect goes away. That is why it was so difficult to, to, to see in advance. 
So what happens next? Uh, well, the chemical industry, which was very much opposed to it, uh, they actually had uh, put in articles and, and, uh, and ads uh, denouncing the whole idea. By that time, they adopted it. Basically, they accepted the scientific findings, and they volunteered to phase it out and replace the chemicals. DuPont and Allied Chemical, uh, somebody may say that their patents were expiring or something, but I think they really were uh, in the forefront of trying to phase them out. Uh, they were skeptics, just like they are today, and some of the same ones, uh, like Fred Singer, uh, <laughs> who said that no, it is not due to that. And some people were saying the Mount Erebus volcano in Antarctica was spewing out stuff that was causing it to this, going to the stratosphere and destroying it. Of course, it's all nonsense, but they persisted, and they still persist. There are blogs, articles, you can read many places where they still are saying that this is all a hoax, uh, the NASA created this hoax. Uh, but the good news is the, the, there were many international treaties, starting with Montreal Protocol, London, Copenhagen, and finally the things have been phased out, and we are definitely towards the recovery, although the data doesn't show it yet. Okay, uh, and the final chapter on this is um, what Paul Newman did. So I told you before that the um, ozone floor was not predicted at all, um, but what about the mid and low latitudes? Did we predict that right? And Paul Newman did his work uh, uh, some years ago, uh, not too, too many years ago, where uh, and other people did as well, where basically they looked at this question of what would have happened if the CFCs had not been phased out, if, the, uh, if you let the CFCs ex uh, increase exponentially, and they, what they found out using the best chemistry we have right now, our understanding of the chemistry and dynamical process is what is shown in this image here. Can you click that now? So basically what he's showing here is how the ozone have changed. This is the expected change in the, in the lower level, and this is what uh, we would have had if uh, we had not phased it out. So it looks like 1982, 1984, things are basically the similar. Uh, but as you start going into, uh, into where the, the ESCs are increasing very rapidly, uh, then you'll see that you start to get huge depletions uh, in, in, the, uh, in ozone if the ECECs would have gone this way rather than the way they actually have gone. So the, uh, you know, we had a peak in around 2000, now we're going down. And, and as, you, as you go here, you'll see that um, by 2020 or 30, uh, you will have ozone hole-like conditions all over the world, including the tropics. Uh, where you get the maximum amount of UV radiation. So, so this uh, would have been a pretty big disaster if the ESC or the chlorines would have been allowed to increase as uh, they were increasing initially. So I think from a hindsight point of view, none of this was predicted. Uh, we could not have foreseen at that time that this is the kind of thing that's going to happen. If we let the, you know, people were talking about 1% per decade, as I mentioned before, the modelers were talking about 1% per decade. Nobody was talking about something as dramatic, as serious as this. And unfortunately, none of that we have to experience, and, and we took the action on time. So what have we learned from this experience? Uh, well, first of all, is that our, our ability to predict the future is limited, no matter how much People believe that we can make predictions about climate 2000 and uh, you know, 2100. It is really is very difficult. And we really do not know what the climate is going to look like in 2100. At any given time, and just as it is for climate, there are diversity of equally valid scientific opinions. And I really want to emphasize the word equally valid. Uh, because there are scientific opinions about climate, chemistry, whatever the subject is, there are many, many different opinions, and they range from a very good uh, best case scenario. I'm not talking about the people who are just skeptics for being a skeptic, but the people who are really genuine scientists who disagree on different things, and they're always going to be that way, uh, no matter what the scientific topic is, ranging from best case to worst case scenarios. And the problem is that the, given the complexity of the Earth system science, it is very hard to predict the tipping points. And so what do you do? Uh, when you have this kind of uncertainty in climate or any particular uh, subject where the, the public policy has to make, what you really don't do, uh, in my view, is what uh, some politicians are doing, is that you make a basic public policy decision on the best case scenario. And you basically ignore uh, the worst case scenario. So even though there are diversity, you really have to create a balanced uh, uh, response to it, just like we do it in private lives. None of us plan for living uh, in, you know, until we are 100, uh, or uh, not having a disaster. That's why we take car insurance and we do various different things to protect ourselves under disaster. So not to protect ourselves against uh, whatever uh, the scientists are talking at that moment, I think is irresponsible. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to carry a lot of weight these days. Okay, so now I come to the next point. 
So there was a nice story, and as I said to you, that is very success successful. You know, we should be all proud, those of us who participated in it. I had a small role to play, but whatever role I played, I think I'm very proud that we really did catch this problem in time, and we were able to solve it. But of course, press is never happy about stories like that. There has to be a, a, a cloud behind a silver lining. So, um, so that I call, uh, I took this word, uh, the twist with history, um, basically is a, uh, is, is a speech that uh, the Prime Minister of India gave at the, uh, in, at the time of the independence of India, and he basically called that a twist with destiny. And before that, FDR had used this term uh, in a different speech, and he was talking about the rendezvous with, uh, with destiny. And, uh, and the, what a twist is, that is basically a private romantic rendezvous. And somehow it appeared to me, from what I'm going to tell you in a minute, that this was appropriate, although you may disagree, but I thought this was what was quite appropriate for what actually happened. So what actually happened? Well, uh, the, I'm going to show you the, the one uh, way this, this story has been described. And that the, uh, the question that I think people were asking is, how did NASA miss the discovery of the ozone hole? Uh, even though it was only a few months after the Farman paper that we released it and we did not know anything about each other. But the way the story has come out, and this is actually a, a, an exact quote from a textbook uh, written by uh, atmospheric chemistry and physics, very famous scientist from Caltech, um, uh, John Seinfeld, who has done an enormous amount of work here, and I'm not blaming him for this, but he does have a quote in this. He says, after the publication of the Farman paper, and this is the important thing here, it turned out upon inspection of the satellite data that low ozone concentration was indeed observed but was systematically been rejected in the database as being outside the reasonable range of data. So that's the way the story was, uh, this is just a mild form of it. You know, if you read books and literature on it, there were lots and lots of very, very high level criticism of how NASA just totally missed this whole event and, big, and one of the major discoveries of the century. So um, I'm just going to spend only a few minutes on it and just because I don't want to belabor this point too much. Uh, first of all, there's part of the story that is correct. It's always the case in urban myths, there's never am completely wrong. There are always things in there that is right. The only thing that is right is the top line. The low values were indeed were flagged as invalid, and I was responsible for programming it, so I really know that they were uh, the flag is invalid. But the problem was discovered, and this is an important point here, because I think this is a philosophical point I want to make. That's why I'm talking about it, not because I was involved. Uh, but because people have carried wrong lessons here. But the problem was discovered as soon as the data were processed in summer 1984, when we first saw it. I remember the, the person who was in charge of processing it called me uh, immediately, and uh, his name was David Lee, and he told me that we were throwing away lots of data over Antarctica. Because what we did was every production run we had produced a fever chart, which is people call it a fever chart, basically telling you where things were not working properly. And we always did that. If somebody was assigned to look at the data right after it came out to really see whether we made a mistake, whether somebody mounted a wrong tape by the time we were using tapes still, and whether we made some sort of mistake. And he called me and said that we were seeing these weird things. All the data were thrown out over Antarctica because we had put in a flag there. Well, within weeks, uh, we determined that it was not bad data, but something really geophysical. Okay, well, that's fine, uh, but what happened after that? The problem is that no one thought at the time that it was a black swan event. What we th because it did not behave like one, it did not walk like one, it just didn't behave like one. Uh, and the, our main thing was, how could a CFC deplete, uh, deplete ozone in just two months a year? Because the rest of the months, things are pretty normal. So how could he have a gas, and we're only talking about gaseous chemistry, that it deplete ozone in just two months a year and not other months a year? That was simply not in the, uh, in something that we really understood at all. So we didn't believe it was a black swan. <coughs> so what happened then? Well, for months, nothing. We were like a deer in the headlight. We just did not know what to think. We had no idea what was going on. We did not, did not think it was chlorine, but we did not know what it was. So finally we decided, uh, to submit a, a paper in an international conference, which is calling it a curious result, not knowing what the importance of the result was. So the credit is the Farman et al. paper that came out a few months before my talk, they had concluded that it was a black swan event. Now whether they had the right theory or not, that's imp unimportant. But they were the first one, as far as I know, they were the very first one who really suggested that this change was a unusual event and it was somehow related to chlorine. And they turned out to be right. Well, by the time I was totally frustrated by this whole situation, and I basically voluntarily decided to leave the project because I just did not like what was going on, and I didn't think that I want to have a career in this field anymore. 
And, and so for, for 40 years I was basically gone and I was working back to my other love which was computer science. Uh, I was working on computer science related field with TRW for a while. And then uh, Franco and Anadi invited me back in 1991 uh, to become as a civil servant and become the head of the, the town's project at, at, at NASA. So what I really would like to say that this thing could have destroyed anybody's career because I was directly involved and in some other institution uh, you could have been blamed. I could have made the scapegoat very easily because I was the one who programmed it. But nobody, as to my knowledge, ever has blamed me for this event. And nobody has, uh, so I really give credit to those of you working for NASA. I think the NASA has been very fair. Certainly it's very fair to me. And the fact that I was re-invited re back in 1991, I had no expectation that I would ever do science, uh, but I was invited to come here and become a civil servant. Then later on I became the head of the branch in atmospheric chemistry. I have no chemistry background. Uh, <laughs> uh, that I think tells you uh, that there are people who are very, very fair. And you do not get scapegoated here as, as often as you might get in some other institutions. So I really think uh, it, was a, it was a pleasure to work for me for NASA. So this is the final part of my talk. So what did I have been doing since 1991 when I joined NASA? But basically I called it a romp in, in hinterlands, scientific hinterlands. What's a romp? Romp is to play roughly and energetically like a child. And that's why I feel sometimes that what I'm doing these days is not going to change the world like the ozone hole discovery did or anything like that, but it really is pleasurable. You know, you, I do things what I like to do, uh, and I will show you some examples of the things that have worked out, but some of them don't work out, so it is okay. Uh, you can do these kind of things because uh, you're working for NASA. So this has been a passion of mine. Uh, I have been working on this for every, you know, every few months I go back to this curve, and this is my favorite curve, and I, you know, I'm probably going to get cremated, so they're not going to put my own tombstone, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, you know, this is what I really like to do. Um, so what is this? this is a, on, on the first order, this is a very simple curve. What it's basically showing you is this ratio of reflectance ratios at 340 nanometer and 380 nanometer. At neither of those two wavelengths, there's any ozone absorption or there's any kind of absorption significantly. So that ratio is determined by only three things. Um, and the, the Rayleigh scattering, which is very strong at these wavelengths, aerosols, clouds, surface reflectivity, and things like that. There's no trace gas absorption to be, to be seen there. And as you change the 380 nanometer reflectance, you basically get this curve. And those of you who have been using Photoshop probably know what a CSB curve looks like. CSB curve is color saturation value, and you can think that this is a saturation and a value curve. So basically it tells you that uh, over here is, is saturated blue, and as you go, uh, of course blue is just a, uh, not a literal blue, uh, and as you go towards the uh, sky b high brightness, you start to get gray color. So basically what you're doing in a qualitative sense is very simple. Uh, you are, when you have uh, dark areas, you see a blue, uh, very blue. Uh, although you don't see that in the visible because the visible, the sky is not blue un unless you look up. You know, when you look down, you don't really see a blue sky. But in the UV, uh, it is very intense blue when you look down and looking at uh, dark sur uh, surfaces, for example, then it does look very, very blue, uh, at least from the instrument perspective. And as you add uh, clouds and things like that, aerosols and so on, you start to get uh, this mixture uh, of blue and the gray, and this is what this curve does. Well, that is interesting, but that's nothing really that interesting. Um, so the question now is, uh, can I model it? And, and how well can I model it? Well, we have, I've been trying, we've been trying for many, many, many decades to try to model it as well as we can. So the first, so that the most recent attempt is, I'm going to skip this, uh, is to model it using a, a very old idea that you treat everything as a Lambertian reflector. So you have aerosol and cloud and the surfaces and all the big mess that you got at the bottom of the atmosphere and you just treat everything like a Lambertian reflector. And you put everything at, this, at the surface. So the, the, the reflector is put at the surface and not in some other altitude. And we assume that the reflectivity that you derive is independent of wavelength. So what you're seeing here is this is an latitude, this is one orbit of data taken from, uh, from OMI instrument now, which is now 354, 388 ratio. And the, the line is the model, and the points are measurements here. And you don't really see agreement between data and measurements, a model and the measurement of this high quality. The R square is 0.99. Uh, well, so you say, well, this is great. We know it's a very, very simple model. It does explain things very, very well. So you quit at this point. Well, we did not. So what you do is you look at the difference between the, uh, this measurement and, the, and this curve here. And this is the second graph. And this is what you get. So this is the residuals, which is basically the simple model minus the measurement minus the simple model. And that's what we call residuals. By the way, the units we use is this old unit 
uh, we started out using called n value because at the time we started uh, we used to use logarithmic detectors uh, and so uh, things are def defined in decibels and so n value is tenth of a decibel which is minus 2.3 percent so all you have to do is to multiply this by minus 2.3 percent and that gives you a percent difference and the way I have plotted that is the warm colors indicate that the 3454 is darker than 388 and so you see lots of things here well I'm, uh, I can spend maybe an hour just talking about all the things that are here but I'm just going to mention a few things uh, these are uh, uh, siglent well why do we see a siglent? Fresnel reflection doesn't change with wavelength well the reason we see a siglent is if you go to the beach and looking at the setting sun reflected from the water the water looks uh, red well in the in UV everything is red even in the sun, noontime sun is red so what you're seeing here is essentially the sun being reflected by the water uh, and that's why it appears red so it's very easy to understand once you, uh, once you figure this out. And then there are other things in here, uh, and I'm going to go a few more details about it. These are uh, caused by dust uh, over Africa, and this was one of the techniques that was, would be developed to be able to monitor the dust and smoke and, and volcanic ash uh, using this kind of a residual technique long time ago. This happened in around 1992-93. Um, then there are other things like this. Now these are cloud-related features. You know, I'm talking about this, the blue colors and everything else. And we still haven't figured out everything that is in here. These are not instrumental effects that we know for sure because they repeat they're, you know, from instrument to instrument and so on. So the question is, what is happening here? And we're not talking about big effects here. This green color is of the order of a half an N value, which only amounts to 1%. So, but, the, the, but the point is, this is the kind of thing that excites me. Why do we have these differences and what is causing them? Can we understand them mathematically? So I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, this is the first thing we did with this residual technique. We were able to, able to track fires and smoke. And these are some old charts I made. There are tons and tons of them now. Then you can actually use this technique to, to be able to track uh, fires over Colorado. Uh, this was something that was made by Christina Su. Where we, this is a multi-day image showing you that the dust from and Gobi Desert can reach the east coast of the United States, going over all the way over the Pacific. So many people have been looking at this. This is just a simple old sample that I picked. Uh, and the point is that this has turned out to be a very useful technique because it works even when the dust goes over cloud or over snow ice. In fact, you get higher sensitivity uh, when these things move over cloud and dust. So if you really want to track this thing over long distances, there's no better way of doing it right now. Of course, MODIS can do highly accurate job, but this long-term tracking of, of the dust and smoke is a really a uh, pretty nice technique. Uh, and this has been used to, uh, uh, to, to mount field campaigns and so on. I'm going to skip that. But then you see other things in the data that you look at it very closely. And this is uh, you know, what you see in the aerosol index uh, when you look at cloud fraction between 0.5 and 0.8. And you see this band that is kind of a curious band, like an instrumental artifact, the same kind of band over here. And after you think about it, you figure out that this is caused by something a well-known event called Fogbo. Uh, that, that those, uh, that's precisely at that angle, you start to see these effects that you do not expect because the Fogbo, as this article says here, is formed by cloud and fog particles of nearly uniform size, and they're nearly white. So even though they're nearly white, you still see that uh, in this ratio of the two wavelengths. And why you see that, I think, is still something that we haven't totally figured it out. Uh, but you do see that. Uh, <coughs> Uh, this is a very nice picture that somebody took, uh, a fog bow over the Ocean Beach, California, showing you this very nice uh, fog bow that you have. In fact, this was discovered a long time ago. Um, in 1752, this figure actually came from a book by Yuan and Iloa, um, and there were three since depicted erupting volcano, the glories and fog bows. And this was published in a paper in Applied Optics in 1991. And they estimated, based on this picture, that the fog particles were of the order of 25 micron. So we were able to see these things, which we did not expect to see. Um, I'm going to skip that. We're trying to understand the model, and I don't have time to talk about it. So I'm just going to skip that. And I'm going to go to this last item, um, which is that this is my favorite, favorite black swan event. That was not the only black swan event. In fact, somebody found this event, and we did not do it. And this was uh, Mike from, uh, from NRL. He's associated with NRL. And he basically uh, came to us one day. He has been looking at the aerosol index. And, and he basically came to us one day and he said that he was looking at some features in the Canadian boreal forest. And he was seeing that we had values 12.7 of aerosol index in that entire area. 
He said, that can be right. It must have some noise in the instrument. And the reason why there was a 12.7 is because the, ex the storage was very expensive. So I had packed uh, the, the aerosol index in, in an 8-bit world. And the maximum you can store by multiply by a factor of 10. So the maximum I can put there is 12.7. So everything that went above 12.7 was made 12.7 because we had no storage available at the time. And those of you who work with uh, computers these days may find this very amusing. But the 12.7 was, uh, uh, was set because that was the highest value we had measured. Not very different than the ozone hole situation. Uh, and but basically what he found was that in 99.9% of .9 the TOMS data, the aerosol index is less than four. And over, even over Amazonia, where you get a huge amount of uh, for, uh, fires and so on, it never ex exceeds 11. But when you get that, this high value, those are caused by, this typically happens in boreal forest fires, and these have been positively now identified by him as being due to pyro CBs, pyro cumulus, uh, cumulonimbus clouds. Well, these things only happen once a year. So this is a really, really a black swan event because it doesn't happen very often. You look at them and you will just th think that they're really bad data. But he was able to uh, do that. And it did change a uh, lot of understanding of how the pyro CBs can inject smoke into the st stratosphere, which everybody thought was not possible. And in fact, there was a very famous paper that many of you probably do not n know or remember, uh, is written by, uh, by uh, the famous paper called by TTAVS. Is it uh, Toon, Turco? I don't know ANP, but Carl Sagan was one of the authors. And they had been looking at uh, nuclear winter. Basically, they're saying, what would happen if there's a nuclear war between Russia and US? And they had come up with the nuclear winter theory that it will create nuclear winter for many, many years. And there was an AGU session on this topic where they revised all of that estimate based on the work that Mike Fromm had done using Tom's data, Modis data, and other data sets. And basically, they concluded that uh, TTAVs had totally underestimated the impact of uh, these nuclear events, or even asteroid impact, and so on. If you create a fire, these fires are going to be very energetic. They are going to go into the stratosphere. They're going to last there for a long time. And the impact can last much, much longer than what TTAVs uh, believed. So it has totally revised our understanding of how these major fires can affect the environment for a very, very long time, because they go into the stratosphere. <coughs> So it, it, to me, this was a really a black swan event. Uh, he, he has made this uh, plot basically showing you uh, all the places where he saw very high values. This is, these are high values over uh, in this latitude and longitude band. And basically, he says here, there's a story in each of these spikes. So if you go behind them, some of them are caused by pyro CBs, and some of them are caused by pyro cumulus clouds. And he has been able to track many of these things uh, using the MODIS data and other data set and being able to understand them. I'm just going to probably skip this a little. Uh, so this is basically showing you that some of these things can go into the stratosphere. This is 14 kilometer altitude, uh, and basically over a different time period and so on. Uh, and this is a image of the pyro CVs uh, that was made. And this is the most recent one. Um, this is from OMI, and basically what he's showing here is a, uh, is a picture from MODIS, which is showing you uh, the cloud, and then you can see the smoke uh, on top of it. And this is an OMI picture, basically showing you where the pyro CVs are, and the values that you see here in the middle is 36.7. And he says that this is the highest value that ever recorded in the entire TOMS and OMI data set, much, much bigger than 12.7 that we thought was possible. So um, I think I'm sort of reaching the end of my talk. Uh, and so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on this because this is really now bothering me a lot because we have been given money, as I told you before, and we are reprocessing the entire number seven and all the Tom's record. And so the question I'm asking myself is that how do I do it now so that there are other, perhaps other uh, black swan things in the data set that we may be able to capture? Well, first of all, let me tell you some of the things that came out after the ozone hole situation. Some of the computer people who started saying that, well, all we had to have was a data mining system. And we would immediately discover the ozone hole. Well, that is garbage, because the, it was discovered by a simple low-cost, uh, tech, um, uh, low, low tech printer plot within hours. Because all we had was a printer plot, and we could tell right away that there was something happening over Antarctica. You do not need sophisticated computer program to tell you uh, that there was something happening over Antarctica. It was discovered within hours. So this was total nonsense. But then there was more uh, articles written. In, in fact, there was an article in the EOS uh, magazine of EOAGU. Uh, where well, the argument was made that we should be very careful about not throwing away unusual scientific data. Well, that's a great idea. All of us would like to do that. But the question right now is, how do you separate? And this is something that I'm still struggling with. How does one tell the difference between unusual, which is the ozone hole was, 
spurious, where the data are look reasonable, but they're not correct for whatever reason, and junk data. You, you know, those of you who are satellite business, we know that all the time we get bad data set because something happens in the transmission. There's a bit flip or some kind, uh, single event upsets, the instruments do funny things. So you always get junk data. So how do you tell? And this is not an easy problem, and I think that not too many people have focused on this issue, is how do you tell between unusual, which you would like to capture, spurious, and the junk data? Now, this is not only our problem, as if you follow the medical community, the medical community is struggling with this all the time. You heard about mammography, you heard about uh, the, uh, the prostate test. How do you tell it, how, what, how much you can accept as the false positives so you can uh, capture one false negative? so that you can capture one of these pyro CV events uh, by, uh, by allowing a lot of other data sets that are not, have nothing to do with pyro CVs to go through. And there's no simple answer to that. It, as you know, that it's a very, very controversial topic. People who have had um, prostate uh, uh, tests and have surgeries, they refuse to believe that their lives were not saved by the tests that they went through. The same with the mammography. Uh, but other people, if you read literature, they will tell you that this is a waste of time and waste of money and we shouldn't be doing it. And they recommend not having uh, PSA tests and so forth. So this is not only our problem. You know, we are not in the, in, the, in the business of saving lives. Uh, but I think it does apply to us. You know, how do we tell the difference between a spurious data set, the junk data set, and unusual data set? So this is where I'm going to end. And I just want to tell those of you who have been with me in this journey, and mo most of you know who you are. Some of them have been, with, like Mitch McPeters, have been with me since 1977. Some of you joined me just in the last one or two years. Well, all, to all of you, really thank you. Uh, I really appreciate your company. Thank you very much. Chandra reviewed the farm and ozone hole paper uh, before its publication. That is correct, yeah. Wondering whether he talked with, uh, with you at the time. Uh, to best of my knowledge, and McPeters can tell me that um, I don't think that there was any discussion at all. Joe Farman <coughs> tells me, and I talked to him a couple of years ago, that they did send a uh, uh, letter to Wallops Island. I, I believe it went to Wallops Island. But we, it never came to Garter, as far as I know. And Sushil never mentioned that to anybody. I think he may have felt that it was not supposed to be done. He was a reviewer. I don't know what happened. I talked to Sushil about it. He unfortunately passed away also a couple of years ago. But he said that he never talked to anybody that, that he can remember. So, um, uh, but that's what way it happens. <laughs> and, um, there are a lot of other things I didn't talk about. There were bad data coming from South Pole, for example. I didn't mention at all because it's no longer important, I think. Uh, but it is an interesting story. There are a lot of other things. that books have been written on it, and, and some of them are pretty nasty. Some of them are very, very carefully written. Uh, they've interviewed people and, and written on that. So it has been a nice story. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a very nice question. Um, so the ozone hole was uh, caused by uh, chlorine in CFCs. Uh, what about the chlorine in swimming pools? Do they have any? <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing about the CFCs that are really remarkable about it, and I really felt kind of sad about it, the CFCs are a gas which are totally inactive. You can breathe them, you, it doesn't go through your body, it doesn't get changed, and it remains in the troposphere for a long, long time without getting, reacting with anything. So these are remarkable, stable uh, gases that have no impact on anything that we know of when they're in the troposphere. The problem is that because they are so stable, uh, unlike the chlorine from other places, or Mount Erebus, for example, uh, that they can slowly go into the stratosphere. And the problem is that once you go into the stratosphere, you have this very strong UV radiation that break apart the molecule. And so that basically re releases with some complex processes, which other people in this room can tell more than I can. Uh, some of them are gaseous phase chemistry, but you can also have chemistry taking place on this polar stratosphere cloud that can release chlorine. But you really need to have these things go up into the stratosphere where these reactions can take place only because there's so much ultraviolet light to break them apart. Uh, but in the, in the troposphere, they're remarkable. They just last forever. Uh, so that really is the main reason for it. Most of the other things we have, they're all destroyed by things like hydroxyl radicals. Uh, you know, nature has been very kind to us, that's why we are here. Uh, that things don't really, uh, you know, there are ways of mechanisms that nature has produced uh, to destroy lots and lots of stuff that is put out. Uh, the problem with the CFC was nature was not ready for it. 
And uh, you know, it was a new molecule that we created it. Another story that Paul uh, Krusen likes to say, uh, which is very interesting, you know, Paul Krusen was one of the Nobel laureates who got the uh, award with Sherry Roland and Marie Molina, that why did they choose chlorine to build the CFC? They could have easily chosen bromine. Well, he said that if they had chosen bromine, bromine is, I think, 100 times more reactive than chlorine is. So if they, the only reason they chose chlorine was because chlorine was cheaper and the bromine is more expensive. But otherwise, there was no reason why they could have not chosen bromine, and that would have created a huge ozone disaster very, very quickly, because them, that is so reactive um, that it would have had a huge impact. So this is the problem with the environment. We do not really understand these things until it's too late. And, uh, okay. Um, so, uh, I've never quite understood what the, uh, since, since the ozone hole itself was, was unexpected, what was the motivation behind doing these measurements originally? Well, as I said, purely curiosity different research. Was it, was yeah. true for the you know, he's right here and he can tell you uh, why we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Geophysical that's right, yeah, that's right, Mike, Mike's right. Yeah, the, the, we're doing lots of diff different things in measuring the atmosphere. And in terms of geophysical year was the very important one. But they were not expecting uh, ozone hole, of course. Yeah. Okay. Okay, one Thank more. Uh, Thank you.